she knows war is coming and that it'll be savage beyond all compare. And no war so bloody as a war between dragons. By now, you've probably heard that George R. R. Martin went scorched earth on House of the Dragon season two. Well, maybe he didn't go full Daenerys, but his comments sparked a media frenzy and heated online debate. Here's the breakdown. Back in July, Martin posted on his Not A Blog website, praising the season premiere. What a great way to start the season, he began. The directing was superb, and I cannot say enough about the acting. The performances were stellar across the board. But despite the praise, Martin hinted at some lingering concerns that he would address later, cryptically dropping the name Mail or the Missing. He said there was a lot to talk about, and boy, was he right. Fast forward to September 4th, Martin posts Beware the Butterflies, detailing his concerns about season two and the removal of Prince Maelor from the blood and cheese scene in A Son for a Son. He notes that casual viewers enjoyed the thrilling episode, while Fire and Blood fans were disappointed by the final scene. Martin has since deleted the controversial post, but not before it spread through social media like wildfire. So, who is Prince Maelor? In Fire and Blood, Prince Maelor is the youngest son of Aegon II and Helena Targaryen, a former gold cloak named Blood and a rat catcher named Cheese force Helena to choose between her two sons. One of the boys must die as payment for the death of Lucerys Valerion at the hands of Helena's brother, Aemond One-Eye. After offering her own life, Helena chooses Maelor, but Jaehaerys is killed instead, leaving her to live with the child she had chosen to die. It's a devastating moment that focuses on Helena's impossible decision. While the scene includes brutality, it's not the core of the tragedy. The tragedy is the choice. This element is crucial to Martin's approach to storytelling, as he often references William Faulkner's idea that the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. In the show, Maelor doesn't exist. Instead, Blood and Cheese ask Helena to identify her son from his twin sister, Jehera. This is a bit of a head-scratcher, as a simple check under their garments would have easily revealed which one was the prince and which was the princess. This alters the weight of the scene, which still worked fine for most viewers. But for book fans, it lacked the emotional impact of Helena's impossible choice, an impact that can be easily replaced by finger-pointing and brutal sound effects. Ryan Condal defended the decision in a podcast that dropped the same day as Martin's blog, stating that the team had to make some compromises in rendering the story when it came to eliminating the Maelor character. The casualty in that was our young children in this show are very young. Very, very young. It did have a ripple effect, and we decided to lean into it and make it a strength. The reasoning doesn't seem to pass the sniff test, but HBO backed Condal's decision, stating that there are few greater fans of George R. R. Martin and his book Fire and Blood than the creative team on House of the Dragon. We believe Ryan Condal and his team have done an extraordinary job, and the millions of fans the series has amassed over the first two seasons will continue to enjoy it. Fans chimed in on the ironic civil war with plenty of memes, and while some fans cheered Martin on, Others questioned why he focused on a minor character like Maelor instead of the other glaring holes in season two. But these fans might be missing the bigger picture. The title of the blog is a warning, Beware the Butterflies. And to understand that warning, we need to go back in time. Yes, back to that moment, this moment, and that moment. And of course, while Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces. We need to find Euron Greyjoy's fleet and sink it. Your Grace, he's already destroyed a good portion of our fleet. Yeah, Dave, we all wish we could forget. Game of Thrones dominated TV and culture for nearly a decade with shocking twists, brutal betrayals, and of course, dragons. But in the final seasons, something shifted the pacing sped up, characters made strange choices, and the intricate web of politics and power struggles unraveled into a rushed and unsatisfying mess. Fans were left wondering how the greatest show on television failed to stick the landing. As shocking as it was, there were early warning signs of the trouble ahead. 
Take Barristan Selmy, for example. Still very much alive in A Song of Ice and Fire, Selmy was killed off prematurely in Game of Thrones Season 5. The actor, Ian McElhenney, didn't agree with this decision, as he was fully aware of his character arc in the books. In a way, unfortunately, I'd read the books. So I had expectations for season five, and as soon as I got the schedule, I thought, well, there's something up here, because I thought I'd be doing more weeks, and in fact, I was doing less than normal. So immediately, I mean, I thought, well, they must be writing me out. And the showrunners, rather than explaining their choices with humility, gleefully mocked the actor for trying to stick to the canon, expressing the joy they would have killing off the character. Usually, you know, people are, are, are quite gracious about it and everything. And, and this year, for the first time, we <laughs> this year for the first time we, we got some pushback yeah. where, where the actor said, um, "You sure about that?" Guess who it is? Did you because have I words? Did, did you say anything to? Well, them I did. I did ask and and uh, give an argument why I thought Barrison should stay. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, Dan and David, you know, they, they'd worked out what they wanted to do. Yeah. So there was a long conversation, then we got a long letter explaining why this was a bad idea. <laughs> Um, which just made us want to kill that person that much more, so, you know. I mean, just because your names are D&D &D doesn't mean you should treat this like a game where you make things up as you go. When there's a beloved canon, rolling the dice on major creative choices might not be the best strategy, especially when your decision is to kill off one of Westeros' greatest swordsmen in a back alley brawl with faceless robbers. This is what Martin is worried about, the kind of arrogance that can destroy a franchise. Dave and Dan's sell-me decision was one of the butterflies George was warning about, one of the many changes that culminated in a heartbreaking fandom and an unrecognizable story. While some blame falls on Martin for not finishing The Winds of Winter, Dave and Dan made questionable changes long before they ran out of source material. While Martin is the master of killing off his characters, Dave and Dan almost killed off their franchise. Almost. Enter House of the Dragon. Most fans were skeptical when the prequel series was announced in the fall of 2019. Back then, the wounds from Game of Thrones were still far too fresh, and confidence was low. But when the show aired almost three years later, critics were quick to admit that they were wrong about the series. Most of us confidently predicted it would come and go like a fart in the winds, including yours truly as it happens. But holy shit, I'm pleased to say that I was 100% wrong on this one. House of the Dragon is a fantastic show that recaptures the spirit of peak Game of Thrones with strong writing, competent world building, and a fantastic cast of characters played by talented and capable actors. In short, it's basically everything I didn't think it would be, and it's a neat a warning not to judge a show by its trailer. It turned out that House of the Dragon wasn't just a cash grab to squeeze what was left out of the fan base. It wasn't a poor man's Game of Thrones. It was its own beast that stood strong on its own two legs. That's right, two legs, not four. House of the Dragon combined the political intrigue of the early Game of Thrones seasons with a riveting family drama and an aesthetic that made the Targaryen dynasty come to life. The reception was overwhelmingly positive, and one of the biggest fans of the show was Martin himself. The author especially praised Patty Considine's portrayal of King Viserys, stating that the character on the show was far better than the one in the books. Martin heaped praise on the actor in his Not A Blog back in 2022, and particularly to Patty Considine for his portrayal of King Viserys, the first of his name. The character he created for the show is so much more powerful and tragic and fully fleshed than my own version in Fire and Blood that I am half tempted to go back and rip up those chapters and rewrite the whole history of his reign. That's some major street cred. Credit where credit is due. The show version of Viserys was almost entirely a new creation, and the showrunners deserve their share of the credit for the character's reimagining and the overall success of the show's first season a season that breathed new life into the dying franchise. It gave fans hope that the Thrones universe could return to its former glory, hope that the creators behind House of the Dragon understood what made this world so compelling, hope that we would enjoy several more years in Westeros and that the show wouldn't follow the same path as its predecessor. But things have changed since season one. Showrunner Miguel Sapochnik left the series between seasons, citing exhaustion leaving Ryan Condal as the sole showrunner for season two. His contributions might have been understated, as season one was universally acclaimed by fans and critics alike, 
with no episode dropping below an 8 out of 10 rating on IMDb. The same can't be said for season 2, in which half of the episodes are below that standard. While Rook's Rest was applauded as one of the series' best episodes, rated higher than season 1's beloved Lord of the Tides, season 2 as a whole was wildly inconsistent. Daemon Targaryen's long vacation at Harrenhal tested the fan base's patience, and people are still arguing whether or not the finale redeemed his lack of action. It's true that Condal hasn't reached the level of audacity as the Thrones showrunners, but one can't help but be reminded of their hubris. Like Ian pushing back against D&D's decision to kill off Barristan Selmy, Martin pushed back against Condal's decision to cut Maelor as detailed in Beware the Butterflies. When Ryan Condal first told me what he meant to do, ages ago, I argued against it. For all these reasons, I didn't argue long or with much heat, however. The change weakened the sequence, I felt, but only a bit. And Ryan had what seemed to be practical reasons for it. They didn't want to deal with casting another child, especially a two-year-old toddler. Kids that young will inevitably slow down production, and there will be budget implications. You can sense George's conflict here. It's as if he knows in his gut that these decisions are wrong, but he doesn't want to get in the way of the showrunners. Perhaps Martin should have pushed back with some Beleriand level heat instead of waiting until it's too late. Budgets and schedules are difficult, but if you can spend millions on CGI dragons, the show can probably afford to have another baby on set. As Martin puts it, simpler is not always better. Killing off Maelor will mean having to change several scenes in the future. One such instance is Bitterbridge. Without getting into too many spoilers, Bitterbridge is a dramatic scene in Fire and Blood involving Prince Maelor and his guardian, Rickard Thorne, that should have taken place in a future season that might not happen if the prince never arrives. Martin doesn't want to see these changes happen, even if that means the result is a bitter bridge between him and the showrunners. Only time will tell if the show can regain the trust and esteem it built in season one, and fans will have to wait until 2026 to find out. Luckily, we have a Knight of the Seven Kingdoms releasing next year to keep us occupied as we continue to debate the future of House of the Dragon and watch the drama unfold behind the scenes. When it comes to delivering a masterpiece, Ryan Condal might be walking on thin ice. Martin's warning shot was an unprofessional but brutally honest attempt to keep the show above water. But despite the controversial decisions, there was still plenty to love about the second season. Ultimately, Condal has the creative freedom to make the show how he wants. Hopefully, we see more changes like King Viserys and fewer missing Maelors. Unlike some, we won't assume that we can write better than Martin, so we'll end with his ominous warning. What will we offer the fans instead once we've killed these butterflies? I have no idea. And there are larger and more toxic butterflies to come if House of the Dragon goes ahead with some of the changes being contemplated for seasons 3 and 4. Unlike George's blog post, we're not deleting this video, so hit like and subscribe, and we promise to drop the next video before Martin releases The Winds of Winter.